True. Let me just tell you, just before we start, my apologies if my back is to you, but I have no option. I'm going to swing from time to time. But uh, do shout, or I'll get other people to tell me if you want to intervene. This is about a conversation. Um, all of you know probably what we're talking about, but some of you may be intrigued as well about where the way things are going. But I do want this to be a conversation if possible. That's why this in the round works so well. So what I'm going to do is um, uh, invite our guests to talk about what they're doing and also uh, the cutting edge of where there are already problems emerging or issues emerging, which are actually strengthening but also challenging uh, some of the uh, models which are being developed around the world. Um, and I want as many contributions from you as possible. Um, and so I will be asking for that. So I will be swinging, looking uh, to see who wants to intervene at some point. Or you can pass me a piece of paper if you want from behind. So I apologize that you're looking at the back of my head. Good. Well, welcome, everybody. We've got an hour for this session. And this is about the on-demand economy. And uh, it's about sharing. It's about peer-to-peer. -peer. It's about on-demand platforms, how they're shifting consumption patterns. Many of you and many of you watching on the web stream will probably be using this uh, uh, now as a matter of course. But which way is the business model developing? Three years ago, four years ago, we wouldn't have even been talking about the kind of things we're talking about today. It really has been a kind of rocket launch of a new sector of the economy and a very successful sector of the economy in virtually all parts of the world. And it's being called the gig economy rather than work. Is it employment? What kind of uh, occupation is being developed for the people who are uh, involved in some of the uh, areas that we're going to be talking about today? These are fascinating and challenging times, particularly if you're in what in the airline business would be called a legacy airline. But if you're in the legacy business of providing bed and breakfast or hotel accommodation uh, or a taxi company and making vast amounts out of the licensing, now all that is being challenged in ways <coughs> which we're going to talk about this morning. Um, the valuations are extraordinary, of course. And let me just remind you of the kind of valuations there are. Um, the market value of Airbnb, it may have changed, of course, but the latest figure I have is uh, 10 billion. You may want to change that in a moment. Uh, 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 Didi uh, Daiche at uh, 8.8 .8 billion. Uber, $41.2 billion. And Lyft at $2.5 billion. And Uber claims to create 20,000 jobs uh, every month on the platform. Are they jobs or is it work? What is the status of uh, those who are working in these new on-demand platforms? And of course, there's a lot of resentment from existing businesses who are being uh, put under enormous pressure, feeling resentful, but having to face up to this new reality. Let me introduce uh, the four panelists we have here today, because I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and explain, for the benefit of those of you who don't know quite what they maybe do, uh, exactly what their business is about. Nathan Blachacic, welcome. Uh, you are from Airbnb. You're the co-founder and the chief technology officer. A lot of people know about Airbnb, but just in one minute, explain for those of who've never decided to uh, uh, test you, go on the website and uh, book uh, an overnight accommodation, what you do? Airbnb allows individuals to uh, rent uh, their primary home when they're not using it. Uh, that might mean an extra bedroom, that might mean the entire place. Uh, today, 1.5 million properties are now available to travelers, and it's just as easy to book these homes as a hotel. And uh, this summer, as many as one million guests per night were doing this. Why are they doing this? It's a way to experience a destination differently, a more local experience. It's a way of experiencing more personal hospitality by connecting uh, with a local, the host who owns the home. Is the valuation correct, 10 billion? It's actually 25 now. Since when? Since about June. OK. Uh, but when you started this out, did you expect it to explode in the way it has, take off like a rocket? It's been about seven and a half years. I think the first year was very difficult. Uh, nobody expected it to succeed then. Uh, but since 2009, it's been up and to the right. What is the critical thing which has made this work for you? 
I think the critical thing is a compelling value proposition. Uh, it's, a different, it's a different product. It's fundamentally different than what was available before. Uh, it's not a substitute for a hotel. It's something entirely different, which stresses uh, cultural exchange, the meeting of people, uh, the experiencing of residential neighborhoods, uh, and all the great local shops that exist in those neighborhoods. All right, thanks. We'll be back with you in a moment. Uh, let's go to Stefan Kazriel, Chief Executive of uh, Upwork USA. What is Upwork? So uh, Upwork is a new name and seemingly a new company, uh, but it's actually the merger of two fairly established Silicon Valley based companies. There was a company called Elance, which was founded in 98, and a company called Odesk, which was founded in 2005. And two years ago, we merged the two companies and just relaunched them as a single uh, new platform uh, a few months ago. And to be clear, uh, what you do? And yeah, what, so what do we do? We, we are uh, a marketplace for freelance work. So our uh, mission is to connect businesses of all sizes across the world with freelance talents, irrespective of location, faster and more efficiently than before. And what does that mean? Um, it means that at any point in time on the site, we have about 100,000 open jobs. Uh, about 30,000 new freelancers sign up on the site every week. We process about a billion dollars of, of work every year right now. And we do this across 75 different work categories. So pretty much anything that you can do in front of a PC or a mobile device from you know, customer support all the way to data science and everything in between can be done on our site. And you know, we do this for millions of people every year, connecting 4 million businesses with 10 million freelancers right now. Tell us, though, what is it, work? employment, what is it that you're providing? You it, talk, you use several different terms, right. several different words there. So it's, it's freelance work. Um, what that means is um, you can sign up on our site without committing to become an employee of us or an employee of anybody else for that matter. Um, however, what we find more and more is uh, freelancers that are realizing this is a new way of managing your career and they actually quit their day-to-day -day job and they start to exclusively work on the platform. And whether that means they work for one client for an extended period of time and essentially exclusively with that client, or whether they take on many, many small gigs and potentially several of them in parallel is really a matter of choice and you know, depends on people's you know, desires and preferences. Okay, we're gonna open that uh, area up because it still is a major problem for you. Uh, what about what you've found in the market, the niche you found in the market. After all, big um, organizations like Manpower have been doing exactly this and making vast amounts of money. What are you doing which is different? So, you know, like, you know, just like Nathan was saying about Airbnb, I mean, this is not an overnight success. You know, we've been at this for a decade now. Um, and I think there's, you know, three components that have made us successful. One is getting to really understand what is the customer need, both on the freelancer side and on the client side, and really building a compelling product that meets those needs uh, in a very unique way. The second one I would say is getting to liquidity, which tends to be a really big topic for marketplaces. You know, you need to have enough supply in order to attract the demand. You need to have enough demand to attract the supply. How do you get that spin wheel started and how do you maintain it moving forward? And doing this in a fast moving job market. You know, the jobs that exist today on our site did not even exist in the world for many of them 10 years ago. So how do you keep evolving this? Um, and I think the third one is, you know, being patient and being there when the market is ready for you. You know, I think the idea of the founders of this company back in the 90s, brilliant idea, but too early for what uh, people were willing to do. And it's now starting to become really mainstream. And you see this younger generation, you know, the millennials, the YGLs that are in this room, usually it resonates with them really well. The younger generation really aspires for this type of career. They don't want the nine to five <coughs> job, working with the same employer, needing to be on premise uh, all the time. They like the flexibility, they like the independence, and the control they have of being in control of their own destiny. So you are redefining work and its value and what people want to do and how much money they expect for it? In a very visionary sense, yes. Okay. Right, let's now move uh, uh, headsets on if you're uh, in English or another language. And uh, to Cheng Wei, who's founder, chairman of the board and chief executive for Didi Kwaiti, um, and uh, also Didi Kachi, which is uh, essentially, uh, in English, take a car. So tell us uh, how you developed your business. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. So uh, DD, uh, three days ago, uh, we changed our name in Chinese uh, uh, from uh, DD to DD Chuxing, which means uh, DD Mobility. Uh, we would like to make use of internet uh, to connect uh, people, vehicles, and all the other means of transportation. 
we are advocating the pooling of uh, uh, cars. Uh, so as uh, to make use of uh, something like uh, buses uh, to enable transportation for more uh, commuters uh, going to and back from work in order to improve efficiency and the experience of mobility and commuting. Three years ago, we uh, had uh, 8 million uh, drivers on our platform and 200 million uh, users. Every day, we are serving uh, 10 million uh, consumers. So we have enjoyed uh, rapid growth. You say rapid, how rapid? Give me an idea. 10 million at the moment. What was it, say, six months ago? Fun. Well, about half a year ago, well, one year ago, we only had the uh, taxi uh, service on our platform without a uh, private car uh, service or dedicated uh, private car service. Around uh, five months ago, we started uh, to have uh, a non-taxi private car service uh, uh, for uh, the commuters. And uh, three months ago, uh, we uh, had a kind of uh, carpooling uh, service. It's kind of a C2C uh, model like Airbnb. Around uh, one month ago, uh, we started to roll out uh, the bus uh, service. With the internet, there's more information uh, symmetry. Uh, you, you will be able to know uh, when the bus will come, and uh, there will be uh, seats for everybody, and it's point to point. It's every month, we're growing a lot this evolved in your mind? Has demand been pushing it, or have you <coughs> dictated the framework which you believed would work? How flexible have you had to be? Um, day one, we simply want to roll out a taxi software. Three days ago, no uh, platform could connect to all the taxis. Uh, Uber in the United States started with private car uh, services. But in China at that time, there was huge uh, taxi uh, penetration. We would like to roll out uh, a mobile application uh, for a taxi app uh, in order to address information asymmetry. But then during the peak hours, uh, no matter how many taxis you have, uh, there's still more demand than supply. Then uh, we uh, started to roll out uh, more service like private cars, the pooling, uh, pooled cars. And then the road resources, uh, the availability of a road uh, has become the biggest bottleneck, uh, hence the bus uh, service. So it's a step-by-step -step, uh, fashion. OK, and already you've changed the identity of what you're doing to mobility, not just car, mobility. Right, now let's uh, look yeah. at the framing of this from the intellectual or the academic point of view uh, as you've tried to sort of define the models. Uh, Aaron, welcome. Uh, you're from uh, the Rosen Faculty um, at New York University. Uh, yes. Aaron Sandrajan, um, what's your analysis of what's happening with this gig economy? And before I go to Aaron, what I'd like to do then is come to several of you in the audience and ask what's on your mind about the way this on-demand economy is going. because. I can, I can respond to the demand in this room to find out what's on your mind about where it's uh, heading. Aaron, what's your analysis of where this is going? Is there now a clear business model? Um, absolutely. Um, I think what we're seeing is the, um, the emergence of a new family of alternatives to the institutional provision of stuff. Um, you know, we're transitioning from getting the goods and services that we want um, from a, uh, a company <clears throat> and moving towards um, you know, getting these goods and services from peer-to-peer -peer platforms. And what this does is that it, it makes supply crowd-based, um, like you, know, you have a million and a half hosts on Airbnb, you've got 10 million drivers on you know, Didi, you've got like you know, 4 million freelancers on Upwork. Um, so the crowd becomes like the source of supply um, the peer-to-peer -peer platform becomes the conduit to sort of fulfilling the demand. Um, we start to blur the lines between personal and professional in the provision of commercial services. Um, so an Airbnb host is not a professional hotelier. Um, a um, sort of a DD car sharing driver may not be a professional driver. Um, perhaps a lot of the freelancers on Upwork did not do this for a living before they started doing it on Upwork. And so this is at the heart of the, all of the regulatory challenges that the sector has faced, this blurring of lines between personal and professional. Um, but we're, what we're also doing is that we are um, increasing the impact of capital and of labor. Um, you know, the spare capacity in people's cars, the spare capacity in people's homes, um, the spare cycles of people's time. 
um, we start to increase the impact of that capital and that labor and uh, therefore lead to sort of a more efficient production model. Um, but along the way, what ends up happening is that we redefine what it means to have a job. Um, I think we You still use to, the word job, do you? Yep. Well, um, like, you know, I, I use the word job as a very 20th century word. I still have a job. Um, I also work for perhaps the only company here whose valuation was the same last year as it is today. And so, like, you know, I'm, I'm very much sort of a part of that economy. So um, we can't talk about a professor as having a gig anymore? Um, well, you know, um, professors have always sort of had gigs on the side. And so we've, we've been a lot more entrepreneurial, but like, you know, we sort of do it from the safe confines of a full-time job. But what I think will happen in a decade, not just in my profession, but in a lot of others, is that you're going to be constructing a portfolio of work, um, some of which of making a living. You know, a lot of people who host on Airbnb may not think of this as work. Um, if you give a person a ride to work on the way to sort of, if you give a person a ride, you may not think of this as equivalent to a job. And so you sort of assemble different gigs, you assemble different tasks, and collectively that will be a substitute for a bigger and bigger fraction of the population from doing the same thing, like, you know, every day, eight hours a day, five days a week, and getting a salary from someone. Do you think mindsets are changing significantly? Is there a generational change in the mindsets at the moment? Is it underway? Has it already happened? Um, I think that we are still in the early stages of it. Um, if you ask someone who's in their 20s, um, like, you know, like someone my age is more likely to talk about who they work for. Someone 20 years younger than me is more likely to talk about what they're working on. And so there is sort of a mindset of not working for one person, but working on projects. Um, but we're sort of still in this liquidity building phase of this. Like, you know, it's, um, you know, we're, we're taking on sort of an industrial sort of setup that has been built over many decades, right? And, um, you know, um, as uh, Stefan pointed out about Upwork over the last decade, they've built liquidity. Um, with Airbnb and with DD, this liquidity building is far more challenging because it has to be done sort of city by city, locality by locality. Um, and so it's going to sort of play out over the next three or four years before they sort of, you know, get up to capacity and start to be sort of a really effective substitute for what would have been industrially provided. And this issue of collaborative consumption now. Yes, I mean, like some people call it collaborative consumption. Some people call it the. What do you share. call it? Um, I call it the sharing economy because it maximizes the number of people who know what I'm talking about. Um, but if I had to choose a term, I would choose crowd-based capitalism, because that's really what it is. Um, it's capitalism. It's a new sort of. It's the evolution of capitalism that is very fundamentally crowd-based. The supply is crowd-based right now. Um, over the next decade, blockchain technologies may make the market making crowd based as well. And so it's a very exciting time. All right, let's just have a quick re Nathan. I think this is something worth spending another minute on, which is uh, the fact that we talk about on demand economy, sharing economy, like these are one thing and the same thing. Uh, and in fact, I think there's a lot of diversity in terms of what's going on under the hood. And there's certainly some themes that apply to all of them. But when we get into the specific issues, I think uh, the answers to those issues are very specific to the individual models. I mean, certainly each of our businesses uh, are very different business models. Uh, they have some things in common. And I was struck just even by talking about Didi, there's four models right within Didi, yeah. right? You have yeah. professional taxis, you have individuals offering their cars, you have carpooling, and now you have buses, all within one company. Uh, and each of those are gonna have separate issues. Um, no. So I think it's important to acknowledge that. And when you think about in the last year, the term on-demand economy has kind of risen up yes. uh, and somewhat replaced sharing economy. They're being used interchangeably. Uh, the difference I see in these two is on-demand economy really stresses the immediacy, speed. And speed is relevant whether it's peer-to-peer -peer or you know, uh, consumer to business. Uh, it's just as relevant to taxis. And so you see the on-demand being applied to everything, including uh, laundry and groceries and food delivery. Sharing economy refers to the idea that uh, there are folks with assets, things that they have sunk costs in, and technology now allows these individuals to monetize a slice of that and not be stuck owning 
and, uh, with no way to get back a stream of income from it. And these are, I mean, these are different things. Let me do a rea reality check here before I open it up immediately. Um, first of all, on Airbnb, uh, for example, in many countries, or some countries in the country I come from, the insurance companies are saying, don't do anything with Airbnb, because actually, not Airbnb specifically, but the insurance <coughs> companies are saying it invalidates uh, their, the insurance if someone uses their capacity overnight and rents it through you. In some cases, that may be true of existing policies, but this is actually an opportunity for insurance companies to offer a new product. Uh, and so, are you seeing that happening already? We are, are seeing you, that. So, some that, insurance, co insurance companies have modified their policies uh, so that you can buy a slightly more expensive policy to get more coverage. And I think you're going to see more of this happening as they realize how big the market is. When the market's small, they're not going to offer this product, and it's going to be about saying no. But once they realize there's enough demand, enough interest, there's going to be uh, more a realization that this is actually an opportunity for them. So there are waves affecting other areas like insurance already from, from your business? Yes, that's beginning to happen. In the meantime, also companies like, like Airbnb, we can bridge the gap. So we also offer uh, insurance for specific uh, use cases. What about the argument on Upwork uh, and also uh, for others who are in the same business as you about the nature of employment and already you're under pressure now because of what you're offering and what you're defining or redefining uh, because there are those who say what you're offering is employment status. Yeah, you know, so, you know, as Aaron mentioned, like we, we operate a very global uh, platform, and so it's hard to give a one size fits all answer. You know, we, we have freelancers in 160 countries. Um, I think what you're referring to specifically is there's been a lot of debate in the US, yeah. and the presidential campaign coming up in particular has made it a, a pretty hot topic. Um, you know, the way we look at this is the law is the law. Um, it may be something that you feel is antiquated. It may be something that, you know, there's a lot of debate around right now. So let me step back. There's two, you know, when we talk about jobs and gigs and all that stuff, these are coin terms. They're not legal terms, right? In the U.S., there's only two types of, of uh, work. There's employment, uh, which is defined by a form called W-2. Mm -hmm. And there's um, independent contractors, which is defined by another tax form called 1099, right? And there are relatively clear laws, even though, you know, like in many cases, there's a gray zone in between. There's relatively clear laws that says, you know, this specific engagement between these two parties should be classified as employment or should be classified as independent contracting. And I think the debate that's happening right now is, are these laws just antiquated and should we just change them? I don't think there's much debate as to uh, can we apply them? Do they, you know, are they sufficiently well explained that we can apply them as a company. So let Do me you believe they have to be changed? So, let, but let me, let me just to be clear, like right now, our, our main goal is to comply with the law, right? So what we offer is we offer to um, mainly our enterprise customers, because that's usually what it applies to. You know, we have a significant part of our business now that is Fortune 500 companies that are, you know, working with hundreds of thousands or even tens of thousands of freelancers at any point in time. And the question for them is, can you make sure that we comply with the law, right? And so we offer a classification service <coughs> that, you know, in every country where they need to operate, determines for every engagement whether the work should be classified as employment or classified as independent contracting. And if it needs to be classified as employment, we can put the freelancer on a payroll in company. So you were talking about staffing companies earlier. Typically, that's where those staffing companies come into play. They put the, the, the specific freelancer on payroll for that particular So to be clear, are you finding workarounds or are you being constrained no, by No, I mean, it's, it's not workarounds. We're complying with the law, right? Okay. So the law is very clear. You comply with the law. Now, does it mean that the law is inconvenient? In many cases, it is. And we'll definitely be extremely interested in working with regulators in every country to say, hey, as this thing emerges, maybe there's a you know, way to change the, the system to make it I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, we're creating jobs for people. Whether you call them employment, work, gigs, whatever, we're giving income to people. It is in the best interest of government to make those jobs be as frictionless as possible and to have you know, laws that are clear and are compelling for everybody in the food chain. Cheng Wei, uh, do you get any pushback here in, in China? Any restrictions? Is the law creating difficulties for you? Is the system creating difficulties for you? Doubtlessly, the rules today was established for business before. For example, the business status uh, uh, situation 50 years ago. But now we have seen the trend, for example, whether we call it shared economy or on-demand economy, to enable it 
the new business models appeared before the policies were made. And I believe it is the same in every country. However, the consen consensus is formed. We Everyone has noticed this. So I believe the uh, policymakers will catch up. They will catch up at the speed that you are developing business. Uh, in fact, Beijing traffic is actually very slow. You will get to your destination. About <laughs> policy makers. <laughs> uh, Be it slow or fast is not the core issue. The trend is more important. The business model's development will show that the value that we demonstrate to the consumers, to the economies, once the policymakers realize that, they will catch up. About year, uh, three years ago, when we first launched our app, it was illegal. People were confused, and they were reluctant to use it, say, uh, thinking, is it going to be safe? How can we use a taxi or find a taxi using an app? How, we, how do we use it? And um, Previous regulations were um, formulated to regulate taxis um, pulling aside the road. 80% of the consumers or taxi drivers two years later started to use, depend their business on the apps. So the new policies later on actually encouraged the apps and to replace the traditional model of calling a call center to cat a taxi. So I think China is definitely trying to embrace the world's trend. Comment, and then well, I'm going to open it up, Barry. Well, I mean, frankly... Well, like, okay, okay, Nathan. I, 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 okay, Just hang on. I, I mean, this is an on-demand session. Let's frankly, go to Aaron the, 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 first. Let's go okay. to Aaron first. All right. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think what we're doing is really sort of rebuilding the trust and sort of protection infrastructure you know, something that was created for an industrial economy um, and has to be reshaped for this new world of cloud-based mm. capitalism. You know, I'm not surprised that Airbnb and Didi and Uber and um, like, you know, all of these platforms have hit up against regulatory roadblocks, have hit up against labor law block roadblocks, because in some sense, regulation is always sort of backward looking um, and innovation sort of goes forward. And so you're going to hit up against these um, these barriers uh, frequently. Um, you know, I think a thread that ties a lot of like, you know, what has been said over the last few minutes together is that, you know, we, we put in place this sort of system of trust um, that, you know, had brand as part of it, had government regulations as part of it, had particular sort of insurance structures as part of it um, for a world in which you went to a company to get your stuff. Now you're going to appear, you're going to someone operating through a platform, and so the regulations have to be rebuilt. Um, the balance between what does the brand provide, what does the government provide, what does insurance provide, what does sort of user feedback provide, that is being shaped now. And a similar thing is happening on the worker protection side. All right. Nathan. Yeah, so, so the, the growth uh, in, in our companies is driving uh, the regulatory conversation, which I think is the way it should be. Uh, you want the regulators not to be creating regulation in the abstract. You want them to be responding to what is happening in the real world. Um, and you wouldn't expect the regulators to be the innovators. Uh, it should be in response to what the innovators are doing. Absolutely. And these things have to happen in tandem, in parallel. Uh, but one thing has to happen before the other. And I'll, I must say, when we were starting out, you know, back in 2009, 2010, even 2011, no regulators wanted to talk about this, <coughs> right? We were eager to have a conversation, but we hadn't had enough success to make it a priority to have the conversation. And so I think what's playing out is only natural, and it's, it's kind of the right order of events. Maybe just zooming out for a moment here, you know, there has been a net increase in economic activity as a result of our businesses. And that's because more consumers are, are spending money. More consumers are taking uh, taxis and other kinds of uh, rides as opposed to driving themselves. More consumers are traveling than they were before. This is fundamentally a good thing. This is increasing the economy. At the same time, on the supply side, there's been a huge increase in supply. There are now many more rooms available, or there are now many more uh, people who are drivers. This is a great thing, and it's an opportunity because with this net increase of economic activity, 
The question for the regulators and for all of us is how should that increase in incremental economic activity be distributed amongst society? And the good news is more of society is now participating on the supply side. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes the people participating are middle class citizens who need this. You're not seeing all the wealth generation being funneled to fewer entities. You're seeing it being funneled increasingly to more uh, more and, and, peers you know, in the economy. And, and it's really interesting that like, you know, I mean, all of the research that I've done on measuring and projecting economic growth from the sharing economy, from peer-to-peer -peer platforms, suggests that, you know, the fundamentals are clear. You've got increased efficiency, um, you've got increased capital impact, you've got increased sort of labor impact, and so you will see an increase in productivity, you've got increased variety, so you will see an increase in consumption. But what's really interesting is that the growth is not just there, but it's inclusive growth. Um, a disproportionate fraction of the value creation that comes from companies like DD or Airbnb or Upwork um, flows to people who are below median income. These are the people who are renting rather than buying and saving money. These are the people who are finding work. These are the people who might sort of buy a better apartment or buy a better car because they can now sort of amortize some of their payments by mm -hmm. sort of repurposing it not just as a personal use asset but as a commercial asset. All right, let's, can you just hold fire, Nathan, because I'd like to get some views. How many people do you want to interview? One, two behind me. How many others? Three, four, five, six, eight. Okay, well, I'd like to get us three or four ideas now, uh, and then keep your ideas brief, please, so uh, uh, our panelists can talk. This is another platform here. Right, I'm going to go to those behind me, first of all. Um, do I have a microphone, please? Could you bring it over here? Um, and also over there as well. There are a couple of people, including the gentleman at the front. Please, be quite brief, please. Okay, I'm not working? Yeah. yeah. I'm a China correspondent for Germany's business daily, Handelsblatt, and I have a question for Cheng Wei. Um, you stated that you want to give the best experience to consumers, but the market was originally divided to Didi and Kuaidi as two big companies. Now there's only one controlling more than 90% of the market, so you have the monopoly, not only for, um, for shared economy with cars, but also for taxi hailing. How do you still want to give good service to consumers if there is no competition? Right. One more question, please. Okay. I'm from Bloomberg Business Week, uh, but I, I still want to ask a question in Chinese. Okay. Uh, oh, My question is for Nathan from Airbnb. Airbnb is entering uh, China, and uh, here in China, uh, there's lack of trust uh, when you live in others' properties. So when Airbnb comes to China, how would you adapt yourself uh, to the unique culture and regulatory environment here? First, that, that first that question <coughs> about the near monopoly that you've generated. Okay. Oh, uh, thank you. Let me talk about my view on the shared economy first and foremost uh, before answering your question. Can you? Because um, there's a lot of other questions here. Okay. Uh, it is by no means a monopoly. We are facing the fiercest uh, competition. Uh, we are having lots of challenges. We are growing out of competition. And we're also in our starting stage. And, well, scale is the key for the taxi economy. There used to be two platforms, as you have rightly mentioned. Uh, I will try DD first, uh, but then uh, second time I will try uh, Quai D. But with the unified uh, platform, uh, it's greater convenience uh, for the passenger. And uh, for the driver, it's, there's also greater convenience. Uh, for example, they used to uh, have to keep two applications running. But now it's just one platform. It's more convenient for the drivers as well. Uh, that's an economy of scale and greater efficiency with only one call center um, unifying the services. Yes, there's a lot of competition, and uh, we are str we're becoming stronger out of competition. Thank you. Nathan, the, the question there about Airbnb yeah, in China. You know, and the question of trust has been uh, one since day one. I mean, that was the first thing that came to mind in 2008. Uh, as we were building this business, and it's something we tackled uh, through our, our review system that allows individuals to accumulate reputation. And, and that system has taken us quite far. It's led to our success in, in almost every country of the world. Uh, will we have to do something in China? Perhaps. Uh, what we do to build reputation is no longer one thing. 
Uh, certainly on the surface, it is the review system, um, but on the back end, it's a team of 250 trust and safety specialists. Uh, it's machine learning uh, and a lot of technology. Uh, so uh, we'll continue to grow that and customize that as appropriate for the China market. Okay, right, let's move down here, please. Microphone at the front, and uh, there's another, someone behind as well. I have... Uh, Where are you from, please? Sorry, my name is Austin Okere. Uh, I work with Computer Warehouse Group headquartered in Lagos, Nigeria. I'm, I'm an entrepreneur in residence at Columbia Business School, New York. Uh, I have a question for Sandra Jan and, and Kasriel. The, the issue with, um, with this sharing economy or whether it's work, uh, is that if someone is going to work for a company, they are going to go to a, a school to certify themselves to qualify to be employed by that company. Uh, and they've gone to some rigor, you know. Now with this one, these are freelancers. Uh, so is it likely that this will just stay at a low level economy, like drivers and hotel <coughs> attendants and so on? Is it, or um, is it going to also have top level people like doctors and so on in, in there? And then All how right, that's a really that? important question. Yeah. Okay, the, the level of skill, what's your, what's your view? Oh, thank so, you, Austin. I mean, Can we move the microphone back to, to whoever? Yeah, the gentleman behind who wants it, please. So I, I can probably give you I'll a few numbers. Um, about 80% of our users have a college degree on the freelance side, and about 20% have a uh, graduate or postgraduate degree, you know, master's, PhD. That is, um, j in just about any country in the world, way, way, way high end compared to the average in the country. Um, in terms of, you know, like, what does it mean for education? I think that's the key issue, right, is the, the education system, the way it was in the 19th and 20th century, you know, like, the, the stuff you learn when you're in school when you're 20 years old um, is to prepare you for jobs that you're going to have 10 years from now. And in most, um, you know, especially the STEM, you know, the science and technology fields, most of the stuff you learn at school, the computer languages you learn, the math that you learn, will no longer exist by the time you're in the workplace. Um, and so there's a need for the schools to prepare you to learn, learn about learning as opposed to learning a very specific skill. And you need to be prepared as I think the younger generation to learn uh, on an ongoing basis for the rest of your life. And, and you'll see a lot of synergies I think between uh, work pl platforms like Upwork and online learning platforms, you know, all of the MOOCs of the world. Um, you may have seen as an example, LinkedIn acquired a company called lynda.com a few months ago. Um, and it's th that, you know, ongoing cycle of people learn something, they do some work, they realize that they, to grow their career they need to so learn something else, then they do more work, and that's how they grow their career moving forward. And just, just to add two quick points to that, um, this is like offshoring. Um, it's not going to be just low skill, it's going to span the skill spectrum, um, this transition from traditional jobs to on demand. Um, what you're going to see happen is that, um, you know, education or like, like the the kind of education that is delivered from a university like mine um, is going to play less of a credentialing role and going to start to sort of like, you know, emphasize more sort of like, you know, entrepreneurship and design and things that prepare you for a world of micro entrepreneurs. Um, I think that your online portfolio, the set of things that you have done, um, if it becomes portable especially, is also going to be an increasingly important part of your credentialing. So you will sort of seek work with not just like, you know, here's where I qualified from, but here is the portfolio of work that I've done. And this won't just apply to photographers or movie makers who already have portfolios, but to consultants and to sort of computer programmers as well. Cheng Wei, what's your view about the effect on skilling and qualifications? Undoubtedly, it's very important, uh, but it depends. It depends on the demand. Uh, in, the, in terms of mobility, uh, there is a uniform credentialing system for the drivers, a uh, driver license. Uh, in contrast uh, to a house chore uh, service provider, there are no standards, uh, whereby there are no standards. On our platform, credentialing is not a problem. Uh, we have uh, some basic uh, credentialing, such as obtaining a uh, driver's license. But for a higher level of uh, service, it depends on the review system uh, like Airbnb uh, has offered. So with 
baseline uh, credentialing, uh, we can differentiate uh, amongst uh, different uh, service providers in terms of their uh, capabilities of uh, service and level of uh, service. Nathan, in Airbnb, about, about qualifications and that particularly important point. Well, you know, I think, I, I think we shouldn't lose sight that what all of our businesses do is, first and foremost, give people the option to have a supplemental income, right? It's not like, first and foremost, it's saying this is a full-time opportunity. Uh, it's not necessarily a replacement for the job. But it does offer everybody a source of supplemental income, and that's really powerful. Uh, Airbnb, for example, was, was founded during the start of the recession, and many of our first users came to Airbnb because they had just lost their job uh, or they needed to make extra money uh, to pay the bills. Uh, and I think that's a powerful economic enabler um, that applies to everybody, including those who have invested in a college education, uh, who have skills, whether it be a medical doctor or not. You know, everybody is looking for extra, e extra income. Even Arun said he's got uh, side gigs uh, that he does as a, as a professor. Uh, and this has been true for decades. That's nothing new. I think the, there's a separate issue here that has nothing to do with on-demand or sharing economy, which is tr there's truly just not enough jobs in the world. There's just not. And so when there's not enough jobs, people uh, come to services like ours trying to make a full paycheck using something that is primarily designed, first and foremost, as a source of supplementary mm -hmm. income. And it's true, many people are able to get by and they're able to piece it together and it's a big help to them. But I shouldn't think anyone should be mistaken that this is uh, something that's meant to replace traditional jobs. Traditional jobs are important, they play a role uh, that our services are not meant to fulfill. But I also think our services add tremendous incremental value on top of the traditional job ecosystem. It's, it's almost like we're shifting the, a larger fraction of the population to being capital owners um, people who sort of make a living not just by providing labor, but by providing sort of access to their capital. Okay, you know? right. Uh, how, how many more people? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, I'm just trying to time. We've got 20 minutes to run, please. My name is Eric, My name is Eric Montero. Microphone, please. Uh, name is Eric Montero. I work for AMIA. We're a loyalty marketing company, global, based in Canada. The question I have is about the nature of competition in the, in the sharing, you know, the, the, the on-demand economy. Um, you know, these businesses are, by definition, intrinsically network-based, um, unlike the industrial economy. So yep. are we likely to see a one-horse race in every space that gets claimed? And if we are, what do you think? The I'm just going to ask you, to, can you repeat that? Can we have a little more sound in here, please? Yeah, the question is about the nature of competition in, in the sharing economy, given that the businesses are intrinsically uh, network-based. So are we likely to see a one-horse race in every space that gets claimed? And if, and if we are, what are the implications of that? That's a really important question. I mean, are you a one-horse? In you your know, business? Uh, I think like everybody else here, probably we track our competitors. Uh, I haven't looked at the list recently, but last time I checked, we had about <coughs> 250. Um, you know, there's thousands of ways you can slice. You've done well. Could they do well? And um, There's a ton of them that do very well. We have a competitor based in you. Australia that is publicly listed. Uh, there's a company here in China that's doing really well. I think the premier yesterday actually mentioned uh, that company during his speech. You know, there's all sorts of businesses that are striving. I mean, the underlying sizes of the markets that we serve are so gigantic you know so we're going to do a billion dollars you know like uh, this year roughly let's say contingent work globally is a trillion dollars right total work globally is about 25 trillion dollars right so if you want to take your market share i know i can't even do the math in my head but it's on the order of 0.05 percent or something like that you can't really say that you don't have competition when you have 0. something percent market share of something nathan do you think you're riding a wave at the moment it could all come crashing uh, you, may be, you may be faced by a competitor who's better than you. So, you know, I think the interesting thing here is that scale in our businesses bring efficiency, and that benefits not just the marketplace, but all the participants in the marketplace. So both uh, the guests and the hosts, in our case, benefit by our global scale. The hosts are able to uh, better sell out their calendar and find guests, and guests are better able to find uh, what they're looking for. But are you scale. aware of those who are pressing you who could actually be better than you in the end? Sure. So, so even though scale is bringing efficiency, the market still starts to segment in interesting ways. So there are certainly domestic uh, players in China that are gaining scale. There are players that focus on luxury that are gaining scale. So even despite our success and our huge scale, others are finding their, their niches too. And those, those businesses are growing quite quickly. Cheng Wei, you've had a great success. Uh, very quickly, could you be marginalized by someone who's as successful as you, or many who are as successful as you? In other words, competitors you see coming who could actually be a real threat to you? <clears throat> well, 
as a matter of, of fact, uh, internet-based competition is fiercer than traditional uh, industries in terms of competition. Uh, if internet is just a channel, then ultimately, uh, the bigger the scale, uh, the bigger the platform, uh, uh, the greater the odds for winning. But uh, in China, uh, that's not the case. We are going to have uh, lots of uh, differentiation. It's not just the channel. It's uh, penetrating the uh, industries like uh, e-commerce. In uh, China, we have had uh, many different platforms uh, around uh, e-commerce. So uh, at the very beginning, it was competition around uh, uh, channel. But uh, later on, it focuses on uh, the uh, specifics of the services, like the types of properties you can offer as a hotel service provider. It's a different stage of a competition. In this market, I mean, business has been long uh, on history of companies who didn't see what was coming until it was too late. Um, I think there was complacency a couple of years ago. Um, I think that any industry that might be um, threatened in some way by a sharing economy platform has sort of sat up and taken notice. Um, I think many of these businesses realize that um, you know, they can comfortably coexist and maybe co-opt some of the aspects of the new business. So the hotels know that they can coexist with Airbnb. Um, the automobile companies are looking at companies like Didi and Uber and saying, is this the future of my industry? And uh, just, just to add to sort of the point on network effects from earlier, um, I think that what Didi um, or Uber sort of faces in terms of it being a one-horse race is very different from Airbnb. Um, there, are, there will be geographic winners, um, definitely like, you know, sort of in the ride-sharing or point-to-point -point urban transportation market, whereas with Airbnb, the segmentation is going to be more like, you know, there'll be luxury, there'll be like, you know, sort of... Um, sort of full service, and then they'll be sort of casual. I should check with Nathan. Are you yeah. thinking of going into the hotel business? No. Okay. Right, please. <laughs> can, I, can I just add one, okay, one yeah. last thing? You know, I think the, the thing that's also really interesting about um, platforms is the, the value chain doesn't need to be pure competition or pure... We, we co-opete with a lot of companies. A lot of our competitors source their talent on our platform. We partner really closely in the enterprise space with traditional staffing firms. So it's not necessarily like a zero-sum game where you know, somebody goes and destroys us or we go yeah. destroy somebody else. There's a lot of value that is created by um, you know, taking the best of two worlds and creating something new out of it. OK, good. Right, let, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take three or four interventions now uh, in the last 15 minutes so we at least know the kind of things that are on your mind. Please, keep them brief. I'm the founder of the WeChat platform, and we have the biggest uh, community of consultants in China. So my question will be, actually, I see a lot of life lifestyle or daily life business, a share economy like DD and Airbnb. But my question is about the, the work, the professional service. Is there any possibility that a share of economy can up to the difficult yes. or complex uh, uh, professional service like lawyer, even consultants, can they have a platform to do that? Is there any possibility or timeline or your plan? All right. As a professor? No. All right. We'll come back to that in a moment. Can you sure. pick, it, pick that up on the consultant? Please pass it back and then we'll go to here. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting conversation. I'm Maria Daranka from the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce in Sweden. Uh, I would like the panel to elaborate a little bit on trust and the peer-to-peer -peer economy. Uh, two questions. Do you know if there is an increased level of trust in general in societies where the peer-to-peer -peer yes. economy is growing? And then an Airbnb specific question. Uh, is it easier for you to access and enter a market in a country such as Sweden, for example, where the general level of trust is considered rather high beforehand? Nathan, note that, will you? Could you move the microphone forward to the lady on the end and then to the gentleman there? So, um, Anara Simpson from Mozilla, and I'm interested from the learning perspective. Um, you touched on the educational bit where, you know, credentialing will be sort of different. As, as people. But what I'm interested in is um, the idea of literacy because, um, you know, your uh, business relies on taxi drivers who can use and write apps. Like, they can actually work with apps as well as yours, right, on a web platform. And so is there something about web literacy, like just basic web literacy that wouldn't give somebody who lives, say, at the foothills of a mountain that has a gorgeous space, but because they don't know about Airbnb right. or can't do it Liter now. Literacy being a constraint. Behind you, please. 
Thank you. My name is Kumar. Uh, I'm in a tech services company. Uh, question, of course, three questions. One, of course, is about data security, privacy. Uh, my personal phone, cell phone, I didn't want to give the information to somebody. I know the taxi driver has my number. He knows where people will know where I'm staying, security issues. Are there any incidences which are, you know, which come up like that, which has been, you know, threatening to your business, uh, you know, because of this whole thing around data security and privacy? The second question was around uh, the, the model of the, the, you talked about the shift into the new capitalism model. Is this model sustainable as a business itself or is it just only valuations that's just driving it and just getting funded, but how sustainable is this economic model by, per, per se at the core of it? So that's the yeah. second question I had. Third one was about regulatory thing around this part-time jobs you talked about. So what exactly is the, is, the, is the sustainability of that, of your economic model? Because people can then go on employ those people like in the future, this. so you will not be <laughs> in business in, uh, afterwards. All right. Three questions, that'll be enough. <laughs> right. We've got a lot of questions there which have been put on the agenda. Can you pick the ones which you are... The, there are several for you, uh, Nathan, specific, specifically on Airbnb. First of all, about data security. Ashley Madison are not represented here, and after all, what they've done online has been... Um, yeah. question, but it's been rather revealing uh, and it's caused a lot of problems. But I, I use that not in a facetious way, but simply to highlight the problem of data security. I think there's two aspects to this question. I think one is a general one around IT data security in general, and that's something that any IT firm has to have top of mind increasingly, and every day you hear about this in the news. So for that reason, it's top of mind for us, and it's an area of uh, extreme investment. You invest on engineering on that. Oh, incredible. Yeah, it's... Mm -hmm. it's it's the biggest concern in the engineering organization is uh, understanding that every, every month the number of attacks on the internet are going up, people are getting more sophisticated, uh, and you've got to be upping your game. And, and that, that should be true of any organization, though, having this top of mind. The second part of this question, though, I think, is around um, with our scale, we are trusted custodians of user data. And I think with government, uh, there is a temptation when they see a lot of data in one place uh, to kind of dip into that and, and say, shouldn't you be giving that data to us? And I think this brings up some, st some sticky questions. Uh, you know, where do you draw the line for reasonable data sharing with government? Uh, and where do you say, uh, you know, this goes beyond uh, what users would want their data to be used for? And I don't think anyone knows the answer to that question, but I think it's something uh, everybody needs to figure out together. Are you under pressure from tax authorities, for example? In some cases, I mean, there was a high-profile case a year ago in New York where the Attorney General was demanding user data, and we pushed back very aggressively on that, and eventually reached a compromise where they narrowed the scope of the data they were requesting, uh, and I think it was a win for everybody. But I think the lesson there was this had to be a conversation and a negotiation, uh, and that's the way it should be, as opposed to... Uh, it's very also easy for, for government to demand and, and for companies to give up data without having uh, or, uh, that negotiation, uh, given the, the nature of the power. Chung Wei, that fascinating question about literacy, about how much that is a limiter to this developing, and you were talking uh, about, I think, uh, the developing nations as much as anything else, uh, and also communities where literacy is not as um, uh, widely... Uh, uh, available. In other words, people are not as literate, so therefore they cannot use your services and cannot participate in them. As a matter of fact, literacy rate in China is actually very high. But to be able to use DD app, you don't necessarily have to be able to read. For a driver, you don't have to necessarily read the screen because everything will have an audio broadcast and there is a very big button to actually enable you to turn on the mic or not so a good app or good product would be enable a certain community or group to be able to learn how to use the app at a extremely low cost you don't have to teach them or send them into the training course to learn to how to use it in urban china we haven't certainly encountered similar restraints, but in the future when we map out, we will certainly look into how to cut the cost, for example, for the senior citizens, for people who struggle to use apps. We will focus on them and try to develop more tailored program for them.
So particularly on that point about consultants uh, and also uh, security, please, as well, picking up what uh, Nathan's already talked about. Sure. Um, so, you know, the question about consultants, um, you know, our, our job market, as, as I mentioned, it's, you know, 3,000 skills, 75 different categories, and it spans from jobs that charge $3 an hour, you know, like data entry work for doctors in the U.S. done by, um, you know, relatively low-skilled workers in emerging markets, all the way to, you know, you mentioned data science. We do a huge amount of data science because, you know, all of our companies are trying to hire data scientists based in Silicon Valley and there's only a handful of them. Meanwhile, you've got incredibly talented data scientists in Eastern Europe. Um, and so it's a huge range, right? I mean, we have people making $3 an hour. We have people making $300 an hour. You know, we have people that do this as a completely part-time gig and they're happy to make $100 in the year. And we have people that make hundreds of thousands of dollars in a year. Um, and, you know, one of the... Um, things that makes you know, like this marketplace interesting and exciting is that you're trying to build you know, an experience that is as good as possible for these you know, dramatically different types of engagement where level of literacy is completely different, the expectations in terms of skills and, and output are completely different, and we're trying to support all of this stuff. And ultimately, you know, it, it looks like the overall labor market in the world, right? I mean, it's a pyramid. There's a very small number of highly skilled wor work in the, in the world, and then there's a huge number of lower skilled work in the world, and there's no particular reason why we'd want to focus on one subset more, more than the other. Data security, I've got to ask you yeah. about that, I because, mean, it's, you it's, know, what, I, I'm, I come back to what happened to Ashley Madison. Right. Within a few days, the chief executive had to resign, quite apart from the business he was in. The fact is, confidence had been breached, privacy had been breached, it affected the brand and reputation. Yeah, so I think somebody asked the question about trust. I mean, marketplaces are built on trust, mm. um, and the trust is, you know, essentially, there's two types of trust, right? There's, do users have confidence in the other users, you know, like it's, it's a peer-to-peer uh, platform. So how do we create that sense of trust? And then separately, do users have trust in the company itself, right? And information security is definitely a key part of that. Um, you know, you, you know, you, you mentioned Ashley Madison a couple of times, but they're not exactly the only company no. that has had issues, including very large, well-known, publicly traded marketplaces, not to give any names. But and it's a high-profile platform. That's why I'm Yeah, and, the, and these are, yeah. you know, extremely important uh, things. So just like Nathan, I used to be the CTO of my company, and so we've spent a huge amount of money uh, and we still do, on keeping the platform secure, you know, doing penetration testing, et cetera, et cetera. Some of which is mandated to us. You know, we handle credit card uh, numbers in a number of countries and different regulators in different countries mandate, you know, different levels of, of testing. But some of it is, I would say, quote unquote, self-inflicted, meaning like it's in our own best interest to make sure that the data that we have about users, the work that's getting done, the earnings, their financial details and all that stuff stays secure. Aaron, this business of trust, again, it's coming through in many of these questions. Absolutely. Um, Ashley Madison is actually an interesting example here because it's sort of a leading indicator of a platform that facilitates peer-to-peer -peer interaction in the real world, right? Based um, on confidentiality <clears throat> and secrecy. Um, and so, you know, I, I think some of the things that Airbnb, some of the innovations from Airbnb are certainly sort of setting the standard for what the trust infrastructure is going to look like for sort of a successful peer-to-peer um, -peer platform. Um, I think the fact that we are um, sort of, you know, providing commercial services um, by interacting with another person who is a quasi-friend actually is raising the level of trust in society to sort of go back to the question. Um, we often take a leap of faith and trust when we meet a stranger. Um, this is something that human beings do, whether you're on a date or whether you're sort of meeting someone for the first time. And so as we facilitate that kind of behavior in our everyday activities, finding a place to stay, getting a ride, overall this will raise trust in society. Um, I also just wanted to say something real quick about complex But let me work. ask, are all these models durable enough to survive even if there were breaches of security? Um, absolutely. See, this is, this is just the culmination of a bunch of changes that digital technology has been causing to the way that we organize economic activity over the last 30 years. Um, offshoring was like, you know, and outsourcing was like, you know, one sign of it. Um, flexible forms of work were another sign of it. And this is just the culmination of a new model of organizing economic, economic activity. So it's certainly resilient. Um, certain professions like, you know, sort of lawyers, doctors, consultants, we'll realize that they are naturally freelance. 
and that they were sort of stuffed into this institutional framework. And now that we have powerful peer-to-peer -peer platforms for them, that they will make the transition more easily than some other professions. All right, Aaron, thank you. I've got two minutes. I'm going to have to uh, stop on that one. Okay, but I, what, what, what I'd like to, about security? I'm just going to give yeah. you advance notice, and I'll let you intervene in a moment. But I'd just like to ask all four of you where you think your businesses <coughs> or the market and the <coughs> businesses will be in, say, a year or two from now, given the explosive um, a way in which your projections are moving and the reality is moving, not just in valuation, but take up. So I'll give you that advance warning, but first, Stefan, so your just, point. Yeah, just to uh, um, add to what Aaron just said, um, in many cases, we're not creating the demand, right? I mean, the, the people wanted to work with each other anyway, mm -hmm. and whatever system they would have used to engage with each other before was definitely quite insecure, right? So one of the benefits in using a platform like, like uh, you know, any of our platform is that we're adding this layer of security and trust that would otherwise make that relationship a lot more risky for people. All right, 30 seconds each. Nathan, uh, share with us confidentially your business projections of where you think you're going to be. No, no one's going to report it. Sure, no problem. <laughs> okay, the yeah. secret is safe with us. The thing that's probably most obvious is that the growth will continue, uh, so that should be no surprise. I think what might be surprising to people, though, is uh, I think there's a lot more to be done to building bridges with the other stakeholders, and I, I, I say that as an opportunity. Remember that everything that we've done has been accomplished over the span of about seven years. I mean, a relatively short period of time, a lot of progress was made. So I'd say in a couple of years from now, a lot more progress can be made, specifically building some of the bridges that have yet to be built. And you brought up the example of insurance right at the beginning. <clears throat> you posed that as a problem, but I think that's a huge opportunity. Challenge. Challenge. Challenge, Challenge yes. Uh, but it is a huge opportunity, and I think uh, our companies can partner uh, with industry, with broader society, cities, neighbors, different stakeholders uh, to create new kinds of value and make a more inclusive uh, uh, um, economy. Cheng Wei, what is your impression of where things are going? What's in your, what's your, what do your instincts tell you at the moment? Two changes. One, Chinese as well as people from the world don't necessarily have to buy an automobile where cities won't allow them to own a vehicle so they will devote themselves into the share company people will start to use the third-party vehicles to lower their cost to ensure better experiences without having to drive you need to accomplish more uh, on the journey so that will be one thing so to own the economy to share the economy the second change the internet is only starting to integrate with or influence the mobility. The platforms in the future will integrate all forms of trans transportation, not only part some of the vehicles, but all of the vehicles. Will The internet in the future will be able to give you a overall coordinator. So that will be the second change. Buy a car. Stefan, quickly, and then Aaron. <laughs> so uh, let me give this you a really disruptive. I'm going to give you a five-year projection, and then I'm going In to 15 seconds, take please. a 20-year projection. Okay. You have more than 50 seconds. You're brave. Um, You're brave. So the five-year projection, uh, confidentially, because we've announced it already, is it took us 10 years to go from zero to a billion dollars. We're going to go from one to 10 in the next five years. And how this is going to happen is because we've, we've just passed the innovator, you know, early adopter phase, and we've become mainstream. I'm willing to bet that there are people in this uh, uh, room here, <coughs> including people on this panel, who are our customers right now. Um, and more of you are going to be our customers. And I think one of the key questions for you guys, frankly, coming out of that meeting is, you know, what should my organization be thinking about in the next five years in terms of how I employ, and particularly how I fight the war for talents? Uh, because if you're not doing it and your competitors are doing it, something wrong is going to happen to you, right? So that's the next five years. The next 20 years, and this is obviously my personal opinion, but I think there are some huge challenges, profound changes that are going to happen to society. And let me give you just a couple. One is people have been, in the last 100 years, flocking to big cities. The cost of living in San Francisco has gotten to a point where even though we pay engineers you know, two, three times more than anywhere else in the world, uh, the cost of living is so high that they still you know, struggle to live in San Francisco. People don't necessarily want to live in San Francisco, it's just where the jobs are, right? So project that you know, 10, 15, 20 years out, you'll see people moving back to you know, second tier cities, you'll see people mm -hmm. using you know, 
DD and other services to commute from time to time to work. But that's a pretty major change okay. to society. All right. Aaron, your last word, please. Is there a danger of overconfidence? <coughs> Um, not, not in this sector. Um, I certainly sort of think that the confidence is sort of based on reality. Um, <clears throat> you know, I see a huge expansion of the hospitality industry over the coming years as a greater and greater fraction of the world is able to enjoy some of the things that like, you know, used to be reserved for the privileged few. Um, I see a massive disruption of the automobile industry that is underway. Do that they is understand going to play that? Out. They understand it, um, but you know, I think it's going to shift market power away mm. from the manufacturers and to the channels. And um, I see a redefinition of like, you know, what we think of as a job and um, a need to sort of construct a new social safety net that recognizes that a significant fraction of the world is going to be making a living um, sort of through gigs rather than through a full-time job. And uh, just one final point, which is that by far, China is the biggest market for the sharing economy. Right, thanks, Aaron. Thank you, thank you all. You've been at a kind of gig session, so thank you all very much indeed. We look forward to next year. <laughs>